Hey everyone, welcome back to another Encore Study Group session. I hope everyone's having a very happy Wednesday. Today we are going to be talking about the components of SD-WAN. In the last session, we talked about those four different planes of operation, the control plane, the data plane, the orchestration plane, and the management plane. And as part of that, there are all these different components that went along with it. Remember the V-Edge and the C-Edge, and then the V-Bond and the orchestration plane, etc. Well, in this session, we're going to be diving deeper into what those components are and how they accomplish what they set out to accomplish within Cisco's SD-WAN environment. So keep in mind that this applies specifically to Cisco's software-defined wide area networking solution. Yeah, Cisco owns Meraki and Meraki has an SD-WAN solution, but it's a very different set of solution or different solution set, I guess I could say. And it definitely is going to differ from other offerings that are out there. So without further ado, I suppose, let's go ahead and dive in here. Oops, I don't think, uh, hold up. The whiteboard isn't quite ready for whatever reason. There we go. I, uh, I did some last minute doodles. <laughs> oh, first of all, let's pull up the agenda here. So um, I guess I was already mentioned here, we're gonna be talking about all the different components. And if we have time at the end, we're going to take a look at how exactly these components are deployed. Spoiler alert, usually in the cloud, <laughs> at least as far as some of our control plane and management plane devices, etc. All right, so with I guess from here, what we're going to do is just pull up a drawing here of a just a WAN environment, and we're going to use this as sort of our base of operations as we walk through all of these different uh, pieces of the solution. All right, so first up is the V-Edge, and when it comes to the V-Edge, again, most of these devices, I'll just write out V-Edge here, most of these devices are going to have a lowercase v in front of it, and the reason for that is because Cisco acquired that company, Viptela, and even though we don't call anything Viptela anymore, those little Vs are indicative of the fact that they came from that provider, so or that uh, producer. Um, when we're talking about the edge of a WAN environment, we're really talking about these routers. We call them edge routers. So anytime, even if this isn't an SD-WAN environment, we have edge routers that are, are attaching to the core of the WAN infrastructure, which usually belongs to a service provider. So these edges, this is why we call them V edges, and then we're going to talk about C edges here in a little bit. But when it comes to the V edges, these are, in a lot of cases, going to be a physical device. And when we think about physical devices, a physical router, from a Cisco world, we like to talk about integrated services routers and aggregation services routers, so ISRs and ASRs, and even the cloud services router, the CSR, that'd be the virtual router instance we're not used to talking about different company routers or routers that belong to different different uh, vendors. But v Viptela was a vendor and before Cisco acquired them, they produced their own hardware. And so when we talk about the V-Edge, we are truly talking about a physical router that, yeah, now they stamp Cisco on there <laughs> because Cisco owns Viptela, but it was a competitive product to Cisco ISRs and ASRs. And so when it comes to deploying these devices out onto our WAN environment, a lot of us who are used to Cisco and always deploying ISRs and ASRs, it's going to feel a little weird throwing a Viptela box into our data, well, not probably in our, maybe our data centers, but into our network closets or wherever our WAN circuits terminate. But either way, we need to get comfortable with that. Now, the other option with the V-Edge is that this could actually be a virtual instance of a V-Edge. That would be a virtual router. I just mentioned the CSR, uh, usually referred to as the CSR V or the CSR 1000 V. In this case, the V stands for virtual. Cisco does have a virtual routing platform. In fact, they not only have the cloud services router, which is a virtual ASR, more or less, they also have a virtual ISR, an ISR V. And that's usually going to be deployed under their ENCS hardware line of, I don't even know what you call those, the servers, sort of, sort of a server a box that's designed to have multiple virtual networking devices running on it at a time. So, um, okay, so that was a detour. That's, that's Cisco's virtual world. Well, Viptel also has a virtual world and that would be a virtual V-Edge. So in most cases, we're gonna see those used in a public cloud space. So we might have a cloud environment and we might have a bunch of servers in this cloud environment. And the desire here would be that we wanna bring these end devices, whatever they are, servers or what have you, and we want to connect that into our network. Now, a lot of these major cloud providers like Amazon and Microsoft, they'll allow you to drop a T1 or MPLS circuit is really the better way of saying it, an MPLS circuit right into your cloud space. So I might have these 
servers on a virtual network segment. And this provider, if this provider allows me to do this, and most major providers will allow me to do this, uh, I can drop a circuit right onto that network segment. And so now I'm able to route this way, but we're missing one key component, and that would be the router itself. So I'm going to usually deploy some kind of virtual router into this cloud space, and that is what will uh, terminate the MPLS circuit. Now it's weird in some way because we're dealing with this world that's not physical and not, it doesn't feel real anymore, right? I mean, we're, we're spinning up virtual machines in a cloud space and we're spinning it up in such a way that now we need a virtual router instance to terminate a virtual MPLS circuit. It's like, is anything real anymore? But the reality is that whatever I'm using from a routing perspective is going to show up in my WAN space just like it would if it was a physical site. And so again, from a Cisco perspective, I might deploy a CSRV up there. And because I have a CSR or an ISRV or what have you, usually a CSRV, uh, I'm going to be able to now configure DMVPN or a, another VPN type of circuit, IPsec uh, tunnel or, or whatever I wanna do in order to get my network in the cloud connected to my network in my organization, ground, I don't know, like my, my primary network. And the way I'm, I'm gonna do that in a lot of cases will be through a WAN circuit, All right? So um, let me see here. So from the perspective of, again, thinking about this V-Edge, the, the whole purpose of today's conversation is to walk through these different components. The V-Edge can be physical and the V-Edge can be virtual. So what exactly is the V-Edge doing from that point forward? Well, what the V-Edges are doing is they're going to form IPsec tunnels. These IPsec tunnels are going to form usually, well, I shouldn't say usually, but in a lot of cases, they're going to be a full mesh of IPsec tunnels, maybe a partial mesh, mesh, bleh, mesh. Uh, but again, these are IPsec tunnels. And so we are forming these tunnels now, not just to the physical ones, but also if I've got this virtual instance, I'm gonna form IPsec tunnels up there. What we're doing is we're forming the overlay of our software defined infrastructure. For those who have followed along through a lot of our previous conversations, you'll recall that when it comes to a software defined infrastructure, usually what we're going to have is an overlay and an underlay. The underlay is some kind of, call it a physical design. Let's say these devices are physically connected in such a way, but it doesn't match what I want the network to look like. And so what I'm going to do, if this is the underlay, is I'm going to create an overlay, and that overlay is formed via tunnels. Now I often joke that the tunnels, a tunneling in the network world, it's like the Swiss Army knife of <laughs> my, my tool set in, from a networking perspective. Uh, so much so that if you, for those who've maybe explored taking the CCIE lab exams, that's the big, well, it's not the tip of the pyramid with Cisco you know, certified architect up there, but you usually don't include that. I mean, the CCIE is, is one of the biggest exams that you can take from a Cisco perspective. You have to fly out somewhere to one of Cisco's locations and take a lab exam. It's an eight hour long lab exam that proves that you can configure the heck out of all of these different Cisco devices. And one of the rules <clears throat> on the CCIE is that you cannot use tunnels. And the reason for that is because Cisco knows, and we all know for the most part, that tunnels can be used to bypass things. The tunnels can be used to do, to create a network that isn't the physical network anymore. For example, in this case, I've said that, you know, if I want to route from uh, subnet C to subnet A down here, I have to go through the tunnel in order to get there. Okay, well, not a whole lot of difference because I was gonna send it out through the WAN circuit anyways, right? Well, there is a big difference in that the devices inside the WAN, from a traditional routing perspective, they would need to know where subnet C is and where subnet A lives. Because anytime a router receives a packet and the destination is not known, it's just gonna drop it. So that's why we share routes with our service providers in a lot of case, or may, or cases, or maybe we have a Metro Ethernet circuit and we've got all of our routers in a full mesh of EIGRP or OSPF neighborships. You know, that's not ideal, but in a lot of cases it's gonna work. And that's why when we hand it off, we're, 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 that's why we're handing those routes off. However, in this tunnel scenario, 
the devices inside of WAN 1, they don't need to know where the destination is anymore. I mean, they do need to, do need to know where a destination is, but the destination is no longer network A. The destination is this router right here because I have encapsulated my traffic into a tunnel. So I take that traffic, which you know the original destination was network A, and I encapsulate that by putting a new header on the front with a destination of the router. So when the packet is traveling through the service provider network, it's going to look at this header, not the internal header. It's not looking at the fact that the destination is network A anymore. It's looking at the fact that the destination is that router. And so long as it knows, again, where that router lives, I can get you to your destination. That means I no longer have to share all of my subnets with the WAN service provider. This is a game changer from an SD-WAN perspective. Um, not only are we not sharing routes into the WAN space, we're using IPsec. That's going to encrypt my traffic across the wide area network. This should make security engineers just in love with the solution right away because independent of any simplifi simplification of routing that we're doing, it's going to actually lock down my wide area network. Now compare that to traditional WANs. I'm not doing any kind of encryption. I'm not doing, um, I, I'm sorry, I'm not doing any encryption and I'm sharing my routes with a uh, multi-tenant wide area network domain. So my upstream carrier, I'm sharing my routes and I'm, I'm hoping and trusting that they don't share my routes with anybody else by mistake. I'm trusting and hoping that they don't accidentally make it so that my network is connected to somebody else's network, which they have the power to do. Now, fortunately, those kinds of mistakes are very rare. I mean, we shouldn't see a whole lot of those, but at the same time, it's still a risk. It's still in a, a call it an attack vector or a surface area of attack or what have you. Bad things could happen to my organization and it's not even my fault. The service provider messed up. Well, this takes our fate into our own hands and says, say, okay, we're not even giving you any of our routes anymore, Mr. Service Provider, Miss Service Provider. <laughs> not giving you routes and I'm not letting you see my traffic. I'm going to encrypt it. Oops. I'm going to encrypt it so that nobody can see what I'm sending. So, uh, oh yeah, back to this drawing over here on the left. So because I'm using these tunnels, I can make the tunnels, so let me see here. If I change color, and let's say I'm going to make it so, let's say I wanna make it so that that middle router right here, this router has a direct connection to all of the other routers. Well, the way I would do that is I would build tunnel interfaces, or I'm sorry, tunnel, uh, well, sure, build tunnels. That was a bad line build tunnels to these four different routers from the center router. Now that is a direct connection. I can even run routing uh, protocols across that tunnel in the right circumstances. That's what GRE allows, right? And so when we, uh, when we do that, what we're doing is we're creating an overlay that looks like this. Now physically, if I'm gonna send from the router in the middle to the router up in the upper right, you and I can both look at this underlay, even though it's been a little covered up here. Um, oh, I just realized I drew under myself again. Darn it. One of these days I'll remember not to do that. All right. There's nothing much you missed down here. It just said destination equals to a, um, to the right there. That's all we missed. Anyways, uh, I apologize for that. Now, um, back to this. So we know by looking at that underlay that if that traffic needs to go from the middle router to the upper right, it's going to have to go down to that router, the bottom left, up to the upper left router and then over to the upper right router. So it's going to have to go through three hops, but those three hops are part of the tunnel mechanism. It's the same thing as in here in this WAN space where I'm encapsulating that traffic and handing it off such that once it gets to my destination router, it unpacks it and it gets the original packet, which is why effectively this is our network. Now we are running our network on the overlay. This is software defined networking. If we're still uncertain about what exactly SDN looks like, that's a big part of it. And there are other components to SD or SDN in general, software defined infrastructures, I suppose, SDI. I mean, there are other components such as controllers and such, which we're gonna talk about here soon um, today. But at the same time, uh, that's a big part of it. Building an overlay on top of an underlay, separating out my physical topology from my logical topology. Um, for those who have studied software defined access, which we are going to look at as we keep going through this Encore blueprint, if you've saw, studied software defined access, 
SDA actually uses VXLAN tunnels. And the cool thing about VXLAN, as opposed to IPsec, is that VXLAN can carry layer two information. So now I can actually share subnets through a layer three domain. I could truly have subnet A down here and subnet A up here. Whoops, draw a real A there. Subnet A and both locations, even though my, my network in the middle is layer three routed. Uh, that's, that's amazing and that's what VXLAN allows us to do. Now we're not using VXLAN in the um, SD-WAN space primarily because from a WAN perspective, there's very seldom a need to share uh, subnets between physical locations. Uh, so for the most part, we don't, we don't wanna change that. We don't wanna like introduce a new way of architecting networks. It's kind of a solution that nobody needs, you know, solution to a problem nobody has <laughs> is the ability to share subnets among WAN locations. But SD access requires that because we're basically gonna build a software defined infrastructure on top of my access layer topology. And I absolutely need to share subnets between my access layer switches. So if I make that into a layer three connection, then well, that's gonna cause problems, hence the X line. All right, so a little bit off the, uh, uh, off the trail with this one. Let me check my notes here. So the V edges, um, just keep in mind that they're gonna be forming these IPsec tunnels to one another. Um, Cisco does restrict our ability to form tunnels based on our licensing. So if we have a really low level of licensing, we're gonna to have to do hub and spoke. Uh, looking at this, if this is our headquarters down here, we'd probably have that be the hub. So it's gonna form IPsec, basically what I have drawn here because I drew all of the tunnels coming from headquarters to all of the other locations. But if I have an advanced licensing, then I could actually make tunneling connections, for example, from this router to the cloud router, from this router to the cloud router. I just have to make sure that I'm licensed for that. Um, internally, facing down this way, we're still going to use traditional routing protocols. We can still run OSPF and BGP. That'd be my laundry timer going. <laughs> um, and, oh yeah. And we also are going to run VRRP between um, routers that are on the same, the same segment. All right, so we still run a lot of the same traditional routing protocols downstream, if you want to call this downstream from the uh, uh, from the edge routers, but upstream we're no longer we're no longer like running BGP to the WAN service provider. That's what we used to have to do. Okay, um, next up, let's talk about the C edge. I'm gonna have to clear a lot of this off. All right, C edge. So we talked about the V edge and how the little V stands for Viptela. Well, if we were to build a SD-WAN uh, edge router on a Cisco platform, what else would we call it? And I've already said it a few times, so you already know the answer. It would be the C edge. So the C edge is basically an ISR, an ASR, or a CSR that is running an iOS XE version that effectively runs all of the SD-WAN magic, I suppose, okay? This is a dumbed down version of iOS XE. We are not logging in and configuring these C edges like we would a traditional Cisco router, even though it could literally be the exact same hardware that's running right next to each other. For example, we might have two ASR 1Ks sitting right next to each other side by side. One is a full-fledged Cisco iOS XE router. The other one would be an SD-WAN version. We're running the SD-WAN image, a different software set on the same hardware. Now, in a lot of cases, um, or I'm sorry, okay, lost my train of thought there. Generally speaking, Cisco is moving away from the V edges and we want to be building our networks now on C edges. So if you already have a Cisco SD-WAN environment out there you have access to, you're probably gonna be spending a lot of time on V edges because that's what has propagated out there. Um, the C edge concept really came about probably about a year ago, this is the time of this video, and it's just taken a while to kind of build momentum. But I don't expect, I mean, Cisco's not gonna be releasing new versions of the V edge hardware line, let's just put it that way. Now, Cisco does allow us to mix and match these throughout the environment. So for example, this could be a V edge here. That is really poor handwriting, uh, V edge. This could be a C edge at site B. The only thing that they highly recommend is that we don't mix and match within a specific site. So down here at site A, these could both be C edges, but they can't be a C edge and a V edge. And the reason for that is because 
as we mentioned just a moment ago that we're running VRRP between the two and uh, possibly running OSPF or BGP. The V edges were designed in an isolated environment and designed to be kind of a, I don't know how to say it. Basically they cheated. <laughs> they broke some of the rules. I say they being Viptela, the original creators of the solution. They, they did some tweaking to the protocols in such a way that they're no longer compatible with other non V edge devices. And so Cisco fixes those in the C edges so that, you know, VRRP runs properly, I suppose. Um, but that's why we don't mix and match. We don't put C edges and V edges at the same site. Okay. That's not a problem normally because, and again, the reason why we can have a C edge here and a V edge here is because these two devices are not running OSPF with each other, They're not running VRRP. The only thing they're doing is using IPsec with each other. Now, if you're going to say being eagle-eyed, it's more of a more of a hearing thing, I think. Um, but if you're listening carefully, you might say, well, wait a second. If we're not running routing protocols among these edge devices, you know, I've, I've said we're not running routing protocols here, and we're not routing, running routing protocols here. So how exactly are we routing throughout the network? Um, how are we exchanging routes? And we, we will get to that later on in this video as well. Okay. Um, Probably a frequently asked question. Can I take an existing ASR? I, I just said ASR. I start ISR. Either way, can I take an existing ASR, ISR, or CSR even? Um, well, that doesn't make any sense. An ISR or an ASR piece of hardware, and can I upgrade that? And the answer is yes. So if I want to take an existing ASR 1K and I want to turn that into an SD WAN router, edge router, then all I need to do is update the iOS version, the software that's running on the router in order to turn it into a C edge. Okay. So upgrading is absolutely allowed. Um, model supported. Okay. So just to knock out the list, we can, uh, we can do ASR one case. We can do ISR one case. We can do ISR four case. And we can do ENCS boxes. Those would be the 5400s. Take that for what it's worth. That's just a general, hey, what product lines are, are supported? Um, we do not see ASR 9Ks, for example, on there. Those don't even run iOS XE, so that would be a big factor there. Um, we don't see the old ISR 2Ks and 3Ks. They have to be the more recent 4K ISR line. And then the ENCS as well. Um, the NCS is that box that I mentioned earlier, I believe it stands for Enterprise Networking Compute System, something like that. And the ENCS runs a hypervisor, a, uh, basically it's running KVM, Kernel Virtual Machine. Uh, we talked about that a few weeks ago or maybe longer ago when we talked about cloud versus on-prem deployments in the study group. Uh, KVM is a, an open source hypervisor, so basically it doesn't cost Cisco anything to run it. They just throw it into um, the ENCS, and we use that to spin up different virtual networking devices. So um, we call those um, virtual network functions, or, well, the reason I'm hesitating is because sometimes it's VNF for virtual network function. Sometimes it's NFV for network function virtualization. Uh, you can take your pick. But the idea here is I could run a virtual router inside of the ENCS. I could run a virtual firewall uh, in ASA. I can run... Um, a virtual wireless LAN controller, for example. So I could have one physical box at a location and that one physical box has my router, my firewall, and my wireless LAN controller for that site. It's pretty cool. If you haven't seen the ENCSs, uh, do some Google searching after this and go check it out because um, they're a really neat device. And I believe Cisco is continuing to invest in that product line. Um, blah, 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 blah. So the reason... Not the reason. Um, one thing to keep in mind here is that one reason why we might want to run ISRs is because the uh, most of us have experience with ISRs. If you don't, the integrated services routers are special because they are focused more on utility than performance. Okay? So the ASRs are all about performance. They're not feature rich. They can route better than any other Cisco routing platform. Um, those ASRs are, are a phenomenal machine, but that's it. That's, they're, they're super efficient at routing, but they can't, for example, 
Um, you can't install a switch module into them. You can't install a server module into them. Yes, the ISRs support those. They support switch modules and servers. There's literally UCS servers you can install into the ISRs as a like a remote domain controller. Um, they've and and the biggest one, probably the biggest one for most of us, would be unified communications. So the fact that we can plug the um, uh, well, let me give an example here. So like up here at site C, if I'm running voice over IP, so I've got telephones hanging off of this network, I need to integrate with the public switched telephone network, PSTN. The PSTN world is usually, shouldn't say it, usually analog, but in a lot of cases it might be an analog line. Um, there's this concept of analog lines such as uh, POTS lines and um, PRIs and such. That, that would be an analog line that connects you to the traditional network, but then you have IP-based lines like SIP um, lines. Uh, e either way, the point is that this router, if it's an ISR, it can perform the translation between the PSTN and the IP phones. Okay? That's, that's what we need, because if, this, if these circuits go down for whatever reason, it would be lovely if we could still make 911 calls. Okay? And so that's what we do is we allow the PSTN to connect to the edge router, which enables our phones in an emergency to be able to make phone calls. Okay. Phones are very important. Um, if, if you can't check the internet, it's not a life or death situation. If a tornado truly came through and took out your WAN circuit and injured people, well, again, think about those scenarios, right? Whatever took out your WAN circuit might have injured somebody and we need to be able to dial 911 or whatever your country's emergency line is. <laughs> In the US, it's 911. All right, <clears throat> what are we at here? Oh, hey, we're, we're, we're not as, uh, we're doing all right. <laughs> I was thinking we'd probably gone over a half, half hour at this point, so good, we're on schedule. Um, so all that to say, all that to say, what, the warning I was about to give is that we are accustomed to using ISRs for this purpose. Not every module in an ISR is supported in an SD-WAN environment. So make sure you do your research if you're going to upgrade an ISR or you're going to deploy new routers out there for Cisco SD-WAN. Either way, you really need to make sure that it's going to support the modules that you need because if whatever is connecting you to that PSTN isn't supported after you upgrade, well, that's gonna leave you in a lurch. And you have to go back to the well and um, which is another way of saying go back and ask for more money, which just nobody likes doing uh, for obvious reasons. So um, do your research before you deploy that. Uh, ISRs, by the way, do introduce EIGRP, not just ISRs, like the whole uh, the whole line. Because again, V edges, Viptela, <clears throat> not Cisco. And so those V edges don't support EIGRP. So if you were to deploy a V edge to a location, and again, we're talking about these downstream connections, we could actually run EIGRP with a C edge, but we could not run an EI, we could not run EIGRP downstream with a V edge. Now it only matters if you have another router down here or whatever, but you know, whatever your network topology is, that would maybe uh, impact your decision-making process. <clears throat> okay, that's enough of that. Let's get on to the V smart. So many, so many V's. There goes my, <laughs> there goes my camera. So that's about right. I mean, 20, 28 and a half minutes. I guess I turned it on a minute before I started recording. Every 30 minutes, my I, I do have another camera on order <laughs> in this uh, quarantine world we live in. Webcams are pretty hard to get a hold of. And uh, my other webcam I have is very low quality. So I go with the one that shuts off every half an hour just so. I look pretty. I don't know. I don't think that's why I do it, but <laughs> either way, it looks a whole lot nicer than my other webcam. Who's here's hoping the net, the new one arrives here really soon. Okay, so the V Smart. Um, the V Smart is the control plane. That's the biggest thing to take away. And we talked about this last time. How we have these planes of operation. We've just spent the first half hour talking about the data plane because the data plane would be the forwarding of traffic. Okay, uh, when we think about it, if we have in a traditional world, we have two devices. We have a control plane and a data plane built in to these two different devices. This would be a, whoops, not DR, DP. This would be the traditional classic networking devices. Uh, every, um, every router and every switch has a control plane and a data plane. 
because what we're doing is we're exchanging information via the control plane so that we can send traffic back and forth at the data plane. The way this traditionally works is, let's say I have two routers speaking OSPF. So they form me OSPF neighborships, they, uh, they uh, adjacencies, I guess is the right word for that. And uh, then we exchange routes, and now I know how to send my traffic. And so when I get traffic in from one interface, I can send it out the appropriate interface. So I use what I learn in the control plane to populate my routing table, for example. That would be data plane enablement. So I mentioned earlier this concept of, well, wait a second, how are these routes learning, or how are these routers learning routes, et cetera, because they are not um, running the control plane anymore. We, in a software-defined world, we're usually scrapping the control plane on the local devices. Now, this is only so true because, like I mentioned, we can actually run OSPF downstream to these other, um, to these other environment or to other routers that might exist within your network there. We, it's not that we don't have any control plane, but from an SD-WAN perspective, we're not exchanging routes. The control plane protocol we're going to use is called the Overlay Management Protocol, or OMP, and this is a, I guess call it, it's owned by vSmart. vSmart is a virtual device that's going to sit out of band from the rest of the SD-WAN world, um, in a lot of cases, this is going to exist in a cloud environment. And this vSmart is going to push information down to these edge devices. And it's going to push information down using the overlay management protocol. So the way, wait, uh, yes. <clears throat> and the way it's doing that is by, I'm checking my notes here. I want to make sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes. OMP. Da, 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 da. Okay. Um, it's also, by the way, pushing configuration. So it's responsible for the configuration that we get as well. So there's not a whole lot to, of, after spending a half an hour on the data plane work, and spend a lot of time on the control plane here. Um, definitely let me know if you have any questions. Chime into the chat if you have any thoughts around any of this. But the biggest thing is that whatever we configure, we're going to be talking about the vManage next. That's the management system. Uh, whatever we configure in vManage gets pushed to the vSmart, and the vSmart pushes it down. So why this middleman concept? Well, because if, if our environment is truly this large, and we've got one, two, three, four routers, and that's the extent of my wide area network, then, you know, it's, that's it. I... I um, I, I could probably have just configured the vManage to speak to those four different routers. But if we scale this out to thousands of routers, literally thousands of routers that Cisco can support this solution, well, it does actually make sense to have a middleman. In fact, we're going to have many middlemen. <laughs> we're going to have a lot of different vSmart controllers. So what's going to happen is our vManage, its icon looks a little like a, a tree thing. Um, the vManage is going to push policy down, me, the admin up here, I log in, I configure policy, and that's going to go to all of the different vSmarts in my environment. And the vSmart icon is sort of this little star atomic symbol thing. So I push it out to the vSmarts, and the vSmarts then push it out to the thousands and thousands and thousands of routers or whatever I have. So it's all about scale. It helps us to scale this out and make sure that the configuration that gets pushed from the management plane shows up on the V edges and the C edges. Okay. So when we think about configurations, we're thinking about the routing context, that would be the VPNs, QoS config, application policies, all of these things. We're gonna talk more about the features of like once we actually have configured this. And we've spent, what, last time we talked about the, um, uh, the different planes of operation, sort of the general architecture. Uh, this week we're diving more into the component side of SD-WAN, but next week, Next time, in two weeks, we're going to have a lot of fun because we're going to talk about the SD-WAN features, essentially, to like the, the, the nice things of why we'd want to go with this. You know, we already talked about the security, and that's great. Um, and the routing simplicity kind of comes along with the software-defined components. But just having some features like application routing and this VPN concept, which is more like VRFs in the SD-WAN world, we need to be aware of these different features that Cisco SD-WAN brings to the table. All right. Um, incidentally, by the way, in case anybody asks, in other words, if you're going to go take an exam, uh, OMP is a TCP based protocol and it is, um, uh, whoops, wait, um, oh, 
like, what was I writing there? It's supposed to be TLS. <laughs> and it occurs over a TLS connection. So um, TLS would be the transport layer security. That's a secure connection over TCP. And then you have DTLS um, <clears throat> for datagram uh, TLS, uh, transport layer security. Uh, DTLS would be the UDP version of TLS. So because of TCP, we're using TLS and that would, um, that gives us some secure connections for transmitting all of this control plane information because we just said we want everything to be secure, right? Okay. <clears throat> that would be vSmart. vManage, again, we're not going to spend a ton of time on this. Here's the gist of this. So next we have the vManage. Um, the vManage is another cloud device. This is going to sit, I'll draw it over here this time, sit in the cloud space. I'm going to draw my X down here so I don't accidentally color underneath myself again. Um, in the cloud somewhere, we're going to have the vManage. It looks again like a resource tree. I assume that's what they're going for with it. And this is going to have an out-of-band connection, oops, not to the, the edge devices, but to my vSmarts. And my vSmarts are usually running right there in the cloud with them. Uh, this is what I'm hoping if we have time at the end, I think we will probably have time at the end uh, to go into the, deploy the deployment models for how um, how we go about deploying these. And usually it's going to be in a cloud space. We can deploy into the private. Um, either way, public cloud, let's say in this case, vManage is going to have an IP address of some kind. I am a user, I'm an admin rather. I'm going to log into that IP address and that gives me GUI access, graphical user interface. So the thing to keep in mind with vManage is that we're not using CLI anymore. Now, even Viptela before Cisco, you know, Cisco loves the CLI and, and there are times when they love the CLI a little too much, just from a modern day perspective, like a lot of companies beat them to creating interfaces that were not CLI driven and which it's a random side trail, but I do believe Cisco, one of the reasons why Cisco clings to the CLI in general and used to especially, um, is because they wanted to create value in, um, for us, for the network engineers who are working on the environment. Like there are easier ways of configuring things, but one of the values of Cisco is how deep you can go at the CLI. And yeah, we don't want to create an environment where like it's secret knowledge or hidden knowledge or anything like that. But those of us who spend a lot of time on the Cisco devices, on these interfaces, we know the CLI inside and out. <clears throat> and so we're able to do a lot of deep troubleshooting and we can figure things out really fast. I mean, I'm sure some people who are watching this have used non-Cisco devices. Every time I've been on a non-Cisco device, I mean, some, some devices have some good um, metrics and such. I tell you, I mean, I'm, when I'm on a Dell switch, there's almost nothing I can do <laughs> from a diagnostic perspective. I shouldn't have said Dell. I shouldn't have called them out specifically. Um, some of the Dell switches have more features than others, but um, just the ability to troubleshoot via CLI has been instrumental to Cisco being used in the enterprise space because when problems happen, you have to be able to lock in and figure out what those are, and the CLI helps us do that. So I dare say <clears throat> some companies were putting the cart before the horse and coming out with these GUI interfaces, these easy to use interfaces before they had the troubleshooting tools to go along with them. Because the main reason we use CLI as much as anything is like I said, to dive deep, to figure things out really quickly. Now that said, I will say if you were to ask me, Hey Jeff, would you rather use the CLI or the GUI to find what port a particular IP address is out? I mean, I'd rather have a GUI tell me that all day long. Even though I can do it via the CLI, it's going to be a lot of, you know, it's going to be looking the up the IP address in the ARP table. Um, if it's not my network, I might, I'm going to have to do some show IP routes and show VLAN uh, IP and briefs and try to figure out what VLAN it's on. Um, then I have to go to that switch and I have to run ARP to figure out what the MAC address is. And then I'm going to have to run show MAC address tables to figure out which switch it's actually attached to and which port. Um, and so that will take that will take time. Even though I can do it via CLI, um, it'd be lovely if I could just type an IP address into the GUI and have it tell me exactly where it is. Well, that's that's what these modern HTML5 interfaces that we have with these SD platforms um, are capable of doing. The tools that Cisco gives us in uh, SD Access and SD WAN and even Cisco ACI, which is their software-defined solution in the data center, those are the the magic three, <laughs> by the way. 
Uh, Cisco has three solutions that go perfectly well together. Uh, software-defined access in the campus infrastructure, SD-WAN for the WAN, ACI for the data center. And all of them give us better troubleshooting tools via this GUI than what we've had in the past. Now, the reality though is that here, the, the way this architecture works is we have a virtual machine. I'll just draw it like this again. So here's our vManage. And the vManage, I want to man, I want to, um, let me, let me draw it like this. Um, if I'm down here and I want to interface with vManage, I'm going to go through the graphical user interface. Oops, let me draw it a little bit smaller. I'm going to use the graphical user interface. Well, what that graphical user interface is actually doing is it's running everything I do through the REST APIs. Now, if you aren't familiar with REST APIs at this point, start doing some Google searching because these are a big deal. The REST API is essentially a way for machines to talk to machines and to do it in a very efficient human readable way. So we're using HTTP, that's what REST uses. It relies on especially those HTTP verbs, like I'm gonna do a get to get information, I'm gonna get a put or a post or a push um, to push information, to do some configuration, I can do a delete operation. All of these HTTP operations, or, or again, verbs, are how I'm going to perform these REST API calls. And then I do it actually at uh, on HTTP ports with the device. So the difference here is that it used to be that when Cisco had some bad GUIs, I remember the, the, the GUI that was part of the old access points. Essentially what, the, what was happening was the GUI would then try to put CLI commands in at the device. That could work great until I also get on via the CLI, I make a bunch of changes that the GUI isn't aware of or that it wasn't expecting. And so when it tries to push CLI changes, uh, it doesn't work. For example, what if I tried to push switch port access VLAN 10 to an interface that I had already configured to be a layer three interface. Okay, that would be a situation where I changed the CLI or I changed the configuration in a way that the GUI, again, either wasn't aware of <clears throat> or wasn't expecting. But I'm no longer doing that. I'm actually using the REST APIs and the REST APIs are a whole lot more robust than the old CLI system. So if I'm doing changes and such, not only can I I do the change, but I can also get verification that my change worked or verification that it didn't work for whatever reason. And so this is a back and forth relationship here. But the point is this, these REST APIs exist on the vManage regardless of whether I'm using it via GUI or not, which means I could also build some Python scripts that go out and make my own REST API calls. There is no difference between me using the GUI and me using my own methodology, whether it's Python scripting or even writing my own application that goes out and makes the calls. I could interface it with a network management system that's able to go out and do this as well. And so that's part of the magic of REST APIs is just this crazy level of interoperability that we get, whether it's my own stuff, again, uh, my own maybe Python scripts or maybe another vendor is designing you know, a network management system, maybe is integrating SD-WAN REST API calls into their own system. And so we can expect to see the ecosystem growing around this over time as well. But it is important that we grasp that, that when I'm logged into the GUI, all I'm doing is making the same REST API calls, REST API calls from that GUI, not me personally, but the, the GUI itself is making those REST API calls in the same way that I could do out of band. So that GUI, I mean, if, if you're really into programmability, and I know a whole lot of people, <clears throat> not Chuck and Hutchinson, uh, <laughs> who are really into this programmability, um, you never have to touch the GUI. You can just go straight to making your own REST API calls. Um, if you wanna, by the way, if you wanna play with this, go download Postman. Postman is a, um, it's an application. They cleverly use post. I mentioned that was one of those HTTP verbs. Um, the Postman allows you to basically make these REST API calls to a system. So you could actually get into Postman. You don't even have to do any fancy scripting. You just get into Postman and you pull up Cisco's documentation in one window and Postman in the other. And you kind of walk through some examples and you get to do some post operations and some get operations. Um, it, it starts to click. I mean, do not, do not fear. If you take one thing away from this whole conversation, do not fear this. 
You don't have to be an expert at it tomorrow. You don't even have to be an expert at it in, in a year, but just don't fear it. Be comfortable with it. Start to see it in action. It's been a slow process for me. I've got a long way to go myself. Um, and I don't think that there would be anybody from a, even Knox and all of the those who are heavily invested in programmability, none of them would say that they've fully arrived either. I mean, this is something that we're just all going to be working on over time. And uh, there's so much great documentation out there to start diving in <clears throat> to the uh, to the programmability world. Okay, um, one one thing I want to point out real quick before we move on. I said I wasn't going to spend long on this subject, didn't I? Uh, Cisco has a vManage you can log into right now if you want to. Now, you know, don't touch that dial, right? Like, <laughs> stick with me for for another 15 minutes. Um, but if you want, you can go out. Let me make sure I get this right. It's sandbox. I believe it's SDWAN. Yes, SDWAN. Cisco.com. But you also need to connect on uh, 8443. So punch that into your web browser, sandboxsdwan.cisco.com colon 8443. Um, if it doesn't load, hit the refresh. It does, it, it's very busy. A lot of people log into it. You can't make configuration changes, but you can click around the interface, which is pretty cool. Um, the username, by the way, is, um, uh, it's devnet user, devnet user. And the password, the super secret password is Cisco with a capital C, then ISCO, that would be Cisco, one, two, three, exclamation point. And so go take a look at, that's an SD WAN up there. Go take a look at that if you want to. After the course, just jot that down on a note, sandbox SD WAN colon 8443. Like I said, it, takes, it, it can take a little while to log in. So just be patient. Once you get logged in, you're usually good to go. It's all about just getting the experience of looking at the interface because you can't use it to spin anything up. You can't use it to push configurations, but just seeing the interface in action can uh, actually go a long way. Okay. <clears throat> and by the way, if you, um, well, <laughs> if you, uh, if you need to, uh, if you want to see that again, just let me know and I'll post it into the chat for those who are watching live. Okay. Um, the V-Bond next, last but not least. I don't know if, uh, well, yeah, I, mean, I guess it is. Is this V-Bond concept, okay? The the V-Bond concept is, this is the icon I couldn't remember last time. Uh, the V-Bond sits out of band from the rest of the network. Does that should sound familiar? V-Manage and V-Smart were the same way. This is probably going to be in a public cloud. Here's our cloud. And its goal, the word bond should be a key reminder for us. Its goal is to glue everything together. We have a little bit of a chicken and egg problem from the perspective of how do these V edges know and C edges know where my V smart controllers are and where, how do they know where to go from a, um, uh, to get to V manage and how do V smart and V manage know where each other are. So the V bond is a very important part of all of this. The V bond is going to allow our devices to first of all, connect and authenticate. And yes, there is an authentication process that these devices need to, or the V edges and C edges need to go through in order to even get into the system. In fact, if you spin up an SD-WAN lab yourself, you're gonna spend a lot of time generating certificates and making sure that all these devices can actually communicate with one another. Um, very annoying in a lab environment, but very, very um, secure. Again, security is a big part of SD-WAN. It's an extraordinarily secure solution to make sure that we don't have uh, rogue devices joining my SD-WAN space. Can you imagine that? If if a bad guy were to figure out how to throw a router on, you know, their own little router here and form a uh, <laughs> form IPsec tunnels to your routers and become part of the SD-WAN uh, infrastructure, that would be, yeah, that would be really, really bad. So the, the certificate process, the authentication, the whitelist model is what we use in order to make sure that when a router comes online, that they are who they say they are. Um, <clears throat> key piece of information with the, with the V-Bond is it absolutely must either have a public IP address or if it has a private IP address, it needs to be behind one-to-one -one NAT. So no PAT, no traditional NAT, anything like that. We have to, we have, to have one-to-one -one operation. Part of that is because this is how, again, this is how we find the V-Bond is we have access to the internet in theory and we can reach out and, um, and communicate with the V-Bond. 
Um, but the other thing the V-Bond can do is help us with NAT traversal. If you think about it, we are building these IPsec tunnels from one router to another, but these routers might actually be behind a, um, might be behind a NAT. Th this might be getting NATed. And so if let's say, now I'm gonna form a, I'm actually, believe it or not, I didn't say this earlier, I'm gonna form tunnels across both of these WAN service providers. Maybe the blue one doesn't have NAT, but the red, or um, I don't know, it doesn't really matter. Maybe the blue one doesn't have NAT, but maybe the yellow service provider does. Um, maybe I'm just behind a DSL line, you know? And, and so I've got two remote locations and they're both out DSL or Comcast cable or Comcast, that's my local one, but a cable provider, whatever the situation is, now I have to get through, I have to form a tunnel between these two routers and they're behind NAT. Well, the way we do that is by leveraging the V-Bond to coordinate a firewall or a firewall, a NAT punch through. The NAT punch through simply means that we communicate to each other at the same time. And that can, in most cases, um, get us through, get us through NAT. Whew. Okay. Um, that's about it. I mean, that's the main thing you need to know about the V-Bond at this point. Uh, again, very piece of, uh, important piece of information would be this right here. The, oops. Uh, the V-Bond must have a public IP address or be behind one-to-one -one NAT. All right, so just as planned, despite the uh, couple of uh, distraction, uh, rabbit trails, etc., let's talk about the deployment options. Um, the main, uh, and this isn't a terribly long conversation either, but, but it's something to be aware of. Cisco, in other words, Viptela, and Cisco acquired Viptela, <clears throat> has a space in the Amazon Web Services or AWS cloud. This cloud environment is the primary mechanism for most of us when we deploy SD-WAN. We're going to deploy um, the vManage, so there's that, that thing again, the vBond and the vSmarts. We're going to deploy those into Cisco's WAN space, or um, a cloud space. There's a lot of benefits to this actually. The biggest benefit is that these devices are configured to reach out to Cisco. And when Cisco sees a particular serial number connecting, it's going to know which VBond to connect you to. All right. So ideally, this is the scenario we go with. And then Cisco has multiple regions within AWS. And so they're going to have, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, basically their, their availability is going to be very high. So we don't, we, we can, you know, just because Cisco is trying to make sure that we trust that they'll be online at any given time because, you know, if your vManage goes down, it's not ideal. It doesn't kill your network communications, but it certainly does make it so that no changes can occur. And it's great that it stays online, but we want that vManage and the vSmarts back online as soon as possible. Hey, <clears throat> that's the public model. That's the public model. Okay. This is, like I said, what most of us are probably going to do, but there are going to be some uh, places that prefer to not deploy into Cisco space. Maybe it's for security purposes. Maybe it's like, okay, I trust you, but I don't. Like, I don't trust that you're going to stay online because web or uh, cloud services go down and I trust my own data center more than I trust yours, Cisco. Okay, that's fine. So we have the, um, you know, call it, call it the hybrid model, really. The hybrid model says that I'm going to deploy the, um, the, the, the devices myself. So V uh, manage, V bond, V smart. I'm going to deploy them into my own private cloud. So this would be the private cloud. And I mean, uh, wait, wait, wait. I want to make sure I am saying this right. I'm going to lose my camera here in a moment. Um, deploy da, da, da. Yes. Okay. Um, and ideally I deploy my redundancy into a public cloud environment. So basically I'm no longer using Cisco anymore. I can use a, a public cloud of my own. Uh, it doesn't have to be my private cloud. It's just, it's going to be in my space is really what it comes down to. All right. Um, and, and ideally all of these devices still have public IP addresses. I think that's what's key here. Now the last model changes that. The last deployment model would look like, uh, what's the color I haven't used? Uh, red, I guess. Um, yeah, 
So, so this changes if, because some, some service providers are not going to allow public IP addresses onto their domain. And if that's the case, um, this could cause problems. So I might need these devices to have private IP addresses. And Cisco technically considers this a third model um, where it's just called a hybrid model with private IP. So with private IP, uh, it, it's the same concept, but we're going to be using NAT on some level in order to give these devices public IP addresses still. Keeping in mind the, the big thing that I just highlighted a few moments ago, which is that this V-Bond needs to have one-to-one -one NAT if we put it behind, if we give it a private IP address, basically, if we put it behind NAT, okay? Um, VSmart and vManage can use standard NAT, but Cisco does recommend one-to-one -one, um, just because it's easier to troubleshoot and easier to support that way. Whew, okay. I didn't lose my camera yet, but I'm just going to go ahead and refresh it there. Let me uh, flip back here. I think I think that about wraps it up. Um, you know, again, there's we, we covered a lot here today, but really, when we're looking at it, we, we primarily focused on the, I call it four, but really there's five different components. We consider the C-Edge. Um, we've talked about the V-Edge and the C-Edge at the data plane. We've talked about the V-Smart at the control plane, the V-Manage at the management plane, and then V-Bond at the orchestration plane. Um, we also took a look at those deployment models to figure out exactly how I would deploy this into my infrastructure. So um, if you want to know more details, more information, I always recommend, of course, our CBT Nuggets. Um, I'm a CBT Nuggets instructor. Yeah, that's the shirt. And so we've got a lot of information. In fact, we just released the SD-WAN. Um, no, 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 I'm sorry. We just released SDA. I, I apologize. We're in the middle of recording SD-WAN. So um, number one, if you want some stuff right away, some more information, um, you can go watch uh, the content in Encore. It's actually, I, I taught it. <laughs> I taught the Encore stuff, but the Encore stuff is primarily more whiteboarding. All right, the SD-WAN uh, uh, content, I guess. The course that we're creating right now, it's me and Knox Hutchinson and Keith Barker. And the, the content that we're putting together right now is is not going to stop with the whiteboard. It's actually going to, you're going to watch Knox and Keith spin this uh, stuff up and take a look at it. So whether we can include labs or not is still trying to, we're still trying to figure that out. But as it uh, turns out, it's not that hard to spin up uh, your own lab environment. And so I believe we got some guides on how to spin up your own um, practice, la practice lab. Cool. All right. Well, hey, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. This has been a lot of fun. Um, it's always great to dive into SD-WAN and, and other exciting architectures. Um, next, in two weeks, uh, on February, February, September 23rd, we are going to be looking at the, well, we're calling it SD-WAN Advanced Services. It's, again, it's some of these uh, features that we get with SD-WAN that's, you know, if you're trying to sell your bosses on it, this is the session you're going to want to tune into. So you know kind of how to pitch it. But, um, you know, at the same time, we'll, we'll make sure we stay technical as well. So with that, I hope everyone has a great rest of your day. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.